welcome to the second edition of the Asiri Designs q and I'm Sharif Asiri, and I'll be answering some of the questions that you've left for me in the comments. In this Q&A, we'll mostly be talking about insulation strategies, spray foam, and durability. Now, because you guys seem to like this Q&A format, I think we're going to start doing monthly Q&As, so get your comments in if you want a chance for them to be featured in the next Q&A. Without further ado, let's get started. So the first question that we have is in regards to interior vapor retarders and rigid foam. Uh, the question is, awesome content, thank you very much. Building a house in humid coastal Canada, what would be your best recommendation for interior vapor retarder using plywood with blue skin and two inches of hard foam insulation on the exterior, two by six wall? All right, so I realize in Canada, you guys are required to put an interior vapor retarder. Historically, this has been polyethylene sheeting. A lot of people still use polyethylene and it's not recommended because it traps moisture within the wall assembly. Now, because you're in a more humid part of Canada, you have all this moisture coming from the coast, uh, you do get a little bit of inward vapor drive. And so uh, moisture moves from warm to cold and from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. And when they're moving in different directions, higher concentrations to lower concentrations winds. And so if you have a lot of humid air outside, you're going to have at least some vapor flow to the interior during parts of the year. That's just a fact. Now, if you have polyethylene on the interior side of that wall, it's gonna trap that moisture and you're gonna see mold eventually eventually start growing in there. We don't want that, that's bad. Now the blue skin is a very good self-adhered membrane. You know, you don't get a lot of air leakage uh, with a self-adhering system because it's bonded to that sheathing. We like that. It's vapor open, we like that as well. Uh, and you have rigid foam on the exterior. That is providing your vapor retarder on the exterior, slowing down that inward vapor drive from that humid coastal air. Now, in this assembly for your vapor retarder, you can get away with latex paint and primer, or if you're forced to install a class one vapor retarder, uh, use something like Intello or Sega Myrex. These are smart vapor retarders and um, they are uh, vapor variable. So when conditions within the wall cavity get humid or wet, uh, you'll have some inward drying potential, but overall it's going to perform very similarly to a sheet of polyethylene in terms of uh, blocking vapor transport from the interior to the exterior. So to summarize, use a smart vapor retarder in this assembly. Overall, your assembly should work pretty well. One recommendation that does come to mind, because you have rigid foam installed on the exterior of this assembly, you want a little bit of a drainage gap between the weather resistive barrier and the rigid foam. Rigid foam is quite smooth and so when it's installed directly against a weather resistive barrier or a membrane and water gets trapped it can be held in tension right and so, because uh, you know you have these two flat surfaces they're squeezed together um, you don't have a lot of a drainage gap so if you can use a dimpled self-adhered membrane um, instead of the blue skin or if you can somehow get your hands on a drainable rigid foam product or if you can dab some beads of sealant on the back side of that rigid foam, let it cure, and then install it, uh, you're going to be golden. This will be a very good assembly. Thanks for the question. Our next question, or comment rather, is about spray foam. Uh, the comment is, just use spray foam, costs more but way better, smiley face, airtight drywall, question mark, sounds ridiculous and way too much work and expense and worries, no thanks, sad face. Uh, yeah, I, I generally agree about the airtight drywall approach. I have a whole video on that, which I believe this comment was from. We want to avoid airtight drywall wherever possible, just because people like to poke holes in it. It's not very reliable. Now, with regard to spray foam, uh, we've had a lot of problems with spray foam, both closed cell and open cell. It off gasses a lot um, and it does not always bond to the substrate that you're installing it on, even if it looks like it does. And so we have taken apart a couple spray foam assemblies uh, for both walls and attics and um, it's not my favorite approach for those reasons. Um, it can off-gas some nasty chemicals, as I've mentioned before in previous videos. We don't like that. And when it doesn't completely bond to that substrate, whether it's sheathing or something else, um, you're eliminating the benefits of an air barrier, right? Not to mention, spray foam can crack uh, if you design the assembly improperly. And so, uh, it might be easier to install, but 
long term, I don't see this being a very good product. Um, you know, spray foam is really useful in situations where you have, where you have very hard to insulate spaces. Um, such as if you have crawl spaces with very limited access, um, that is a place for spray foam, though it's still not ideal. The flat roof retrofits, installing that spray foam on the exterior is actually quite beneficial, but you know, it's, it's not ideal. So for now, I'm not recommending spray foam at all. I'll talk more about spray foam in later videos. Uh, for now, use rigid foam and sealants. Um, those are gonna be a lot more reliable. They're not gonna off-gas nearly as much as spray foam, and it's gonna perform a lot better and um, a lot more predictably. Thanks for the comment. Now, this next comment is in regard to my video on insulating crawl spaces. Now, the comment says, Insulation on the interior side of the stem wall is incorrect. Insulation should always go on the exterior. Where do you wear your coat? Generally, I agree with this sentiment. However, when we're locating insulation below grade, it's at a lot higher risk of deterioration both from bugs, uh, from water, and if that insulation gets saturated with water, we get a loss of our value. Um, also, if that insulation gets wet, bugs love to burrow into it, um, especially rigid foams. And I'm gonna put a video up here, which I'm stealing from Instagram that someone sent me of ants just totally swarming this polyiso uh, that this guy had laying on his job site inside, not even outside, this, this was on a slab. Um, but the ants got to it and they started burrowing into it. And so in general, from a durability standpoint, uh, we want to actually insulate from the interior if possible uh, whenever we're dealing with below grade structures. Um, now, there are ways to detail exterior insulation uh, for below grade you know, basements and crawl spaces so that it has a much higher chance of success. For example, if you um, use uh, rock wool um, or rigid mineral wool instead of rigid foam, you're gonna significantly improve the durability of that rigid insulation just because bugs don't really burrow into uh, mineral wool as easily, nor do they really want to. And uh, it doesn't deteriorate if it gets wet. Mineral wool is very hydrophobic, and so if, let's say, there are some wet conditions, you have uh, water spilling into that space between um, the backfill and the rigid insulation, you're not going to have water be absorbed into that mineral wool. It's just going to drain down, um, and that's the other thing. Uh, rigid mineral wool is very good at draining water. Now, you would want to detail the exterior insulation with a dimple mat, and you'd want to make sure that you have a lot of free draining backfill, you know, ensuring that water isn't going to uh, challenge that insulation whatsoever. And this goes for whether you're using rock wool or if you're using any kind of rigid foam. The other consideration that you have to think about is that the termination of the top of the rigid insulation has to be considered in the design. You don't want a whole bunch of rigid insulation sticking out of the foundation if you don't have rigid insulation on the exterior walls as well because it can look a little funky. So from an aesthetic standpoint, you have to consider that. Now you said insulation on the interior side of the stem wall is incorrect. It's not incorrect if you detail it properly, and that it all comes down to execution. If you use rigid foam on the interior side of the stem wall, taped joints, um, do a good job about air sealing that, that rigid insulation, you're not going to have any issues. It works for basements, it works for crawl spaces. You have somewhat of a small thermal penalty, but overall it's still a thermal break between the interior conditioned space and the exterior environment. Anyways, thank you for the comment. I always enjoy the back and forth. All right, our next comment is also about spray foam. Approximately how long does closed cell spray foam take to off gas? I'm assuming that your autocorrect changed uh, closed to clothes, so we'll ignore that. Are you talking about one week, three weeks, month, question mark? Okay, closed cell spray foam has the ability to off gas for many months after the installation, and sometimes you even hear about it off gassing odors for years. Um, this is especially true in attic applications, um, where if you just do a simple Google search and you'll see on forums like Green Building Advisor, this is a widespread issue. I took a poll of my Instagram audience about closed cell spray foam and off-gassing issues and odors, and 
I think over half of them uh, mentioned that they had issues with off-gassing and odors long after the installation. So we're not talking about weeks, we're not talking about three weeks, we're talking about months to years. And this is across multiple spray foam products. Um, this isn't just uh, your standard closed cell spray foam, this is also the green spray foams. And so this has to be taken into account depending on who your client is. If your client is sensitive to chemicals, if they're sensitive to these types of odors, uh, it's probably not a good idea to install closed cell spray foam or open cell spray foam in the building. Now, if that closed cell spray foam is either encapsulated or isolated from the interior condition space, then I don't really have a problem with it because it's, you know, it's not coming into contact with that interior air. It's not, you know, off-gassing into the interior. And so some applications for this would be, you know, closed cell spray foam on the exterior of the assembly or under a floor slab. Um, those are some more appropriate locations for closed cell spray foam without as many risks of it off-gassing to the interior. Some people have had very good luck with spray foam and some people don't notice uh, the odors, but it does off-gas. It off-gasses both odorless chemicals and chemicals that do have odors, and the ones that are odorless tend to be more problematic than the ones that do have odors. And so this all needs to be taken into account when you're thinking about spray foam, as well as the other things that I mentioned uh, before as far as um, spray foam cracking, not completely bonding to the substrate. So use spray foam with caution. Again, I'm not recommending it as a solution at the moment. All right, our last question is about ICF basements. So the question is, so if you're building an ICF basement, should you tape seams and foam blocks? Not only should you tape the seams, but you need to apply a fully adhered membrane on the ICF blocks. Um, here's the thing. There is a misconception that ICF is inherently waterproof because uh, it has concrete, has foam block, and that's just not the case. Uh, Concrete can absorb a lot of water. Um, water can make its way through the seams and be distributed inwards, okay? We want to apply a sheet waterproofing that's bonded to the rigid foam. And this is really important too. We wanna to make sure that we're not using a solvent-based adhesive because then uh, it can eat away at that rigid foam. So we want a compatible fully adhered membrane that's installed over the blocks um, to repel water and keep water from uh, infiltrating through the seams of the blocks and, and being absorbed by that uh, concrete foundation wall. That is going to be critical. That's what most, if not all, ICF manufacturers recommend. Um, and those that don't, um, it's quite foolish. So in answer to your question, taping the seams is not enough. You need a fully adhered membrane with non-solvent based adhesives installed over those ICF blocks to ensure water doesn't find a path inwards. You should also install a dimple mat or some type of drainage mat against the foundation walls to alleviate hydrostatic pressure and to make sure that you're not challenging the waterproofing. Now, I just released my latest ebook on basement design, and we do cover ICF basements, but I highly recommend it if you're building a basement or if you build basements. Um, this is great for design professionals, builders, contractors, subcontractors, and even do-it-yourselfers. There's a lot of information there for everyone and some stuff I wish I knew when I first started doing this. Anyways, thanks so much for watching the video. Again, we're going to start doing these Q&As at the start of every month. Give this video a like if you haven't already, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. Head over to asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck with your projects. Cheers.